about best practices, but very often those best practices come from you, the people who are using these as news gathering and reporting tools. And so if you have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand during the session and we can kind of answer them before we move on. Uh, a little bit about myself before I keep going. I have been at Facebook for almost three years. Before this, I spent six years at the New York Times as a senior staff editor. I worked on the news desk, so I ma mainly covered and edited breaking and international news. Um, after that, I spent, before that, I spent time at CNN.com and the Miami Herald. And in each of those roles, a core part of my responsibility was training journalists, uh, improving newsroom processes and workflows. It's definitely something I'm very, very passionate about in terms of as we adapt to new technology. So we're here today under the auspices of the Facebook Journalism Project. It's an initiative that we recently announced in January, and it kind of publicly signals um, our desire to collaborate more deeply with publishers and journalists. Uh, we've always been open to iterating on products based on feedback, uh, but with this initiative, we're committing to go deeper and broader uh, with that project. So I want to read this quote by Fiji Simo, who is uh, the director of media products at Facebook. And Fiji said, we know that our community values sharing and discussing ideas and news. And as a part of our service, we care a great deal about making sure that a healthy news ecosystem and journalism can thrive. Uh, now, as I said, I started at Facebook almost three years ago, and such an initiative would have made little sense back then. We sent a lot of referral traffic to publishers, but it was tiny compared to now. We had little video. We had no live video. We had no 360, no 360 live, no messenger bots. We didn't even have a messenger app. But a lot has changed, and as Fiji says, we take very seriously our role in having and developing a healthy news ecosystem. So there are three key pillars to the Facebook Journalism Project. The first, which I've somewhat touched on, is product collaboration. So we've begun a much deeper collaboration with news organizations across the spectrum, um, making sure that our product and engineering teams are being connected to publishers earlier in the alpha and beta process of products so that we can iterate on those products based on partner feedback from journalists. Um, we're experiment experimenting with a lot of new storytelling formats, so 360 live video, uh, support for your business models around video by testing ad breaks and subscriptions. Um, and doing things that can help you foster deeper connections with your readers and or viewers. Uh, we also are trying to explore whether there's something unique we can do in regional news and, and we're hoping to have more progress there by the end of the year. What I focus on specifically and what this workshop will drill down on is training and tools for journalists. Um, so I not only take your product feedback and uh, tips about how the product should work to internal teams, but I try to streamline our training materials. I host sessions like this. I can come into your newsrooms and try to work with your news gatherers, reporters, and editors one-on-one. -on -one. Um, today I'm going to walk you through what some of that looks like and some of the strategies and examples we've seen as we've built out some of our training materials. The third pillar we call Tools for Everyone. And we know that the power of Facebook is really giving people the ability to share the things they care about. But as part of that project, we want to make sure that we're empowering people to have more information about what they're sharing with their friends and family and that we're really building informed communities on Facebook. So we've done this in a few forms. The first is a, a PSA campaign that you may have seen on top of Newsfeed that kind of walks uh, regular people through some tips and strategies they can use to determine the trustworthiness of a source. Um, we've partnered with third party fact, uh, fact checkers who can look at stories that users have reported as untrustworthy or suspicious. The fact checkers can then upload uh, evidence to rebut this and it becomes flagged uh, as disputed in Newsfeed. And the third one that we're really excited to be a part of, which recently launched, is the News Integrity Initiative. Uh, this is a global consortium of 25 partners who are really going to drill down on research and outreach campaigns to make sure that we're educating people um, on just being savvier and more informed news consumers. So before we get to today, I love looking at this photo. I want you to look at, this is the Facebook one word, dot com in 2004. And so look at what you can do. You can search for people at your school. You can find out who's in your classes. You could see who was friends with your friends. You could see a visualization of your social network. But that was it. There were no photos. There were no articles, no video. You couldn't even interact with someone that wasn't in college unless they were faking it with an email address. <laughs> so in 
So fast forward to today, and what and how people are sharing is obviously extremely different than it was five years ago, much less in 2004. Uh, it's gone from text to much more visual, from photos to videos, and now to virtual and augmented reality. Uh, we know that this shift requires uh, that we improve our tools that allow journalists to be more innovative in this visual storytelling. Um, and here's a quick video up next that kind of looks at some of those innovations we've seen journalists doing across the spectrum. on the top right. I'll run it back. This video is even better with the volume on, I promise. <laughs> Close enough. Well, if anybody wants a personal screening of that, you can find me at the booth later, <laughs> later this week, and we'll do it. Um, so, in the last few months, uh, clickers not on that working. So in the last few months, we've launched a training site for journalists, super easy, facebook.com slash journalists. Um, and we've been working to increase our offerings there. So we currently have four free e-learning courses, which are available in 10 languages, including Bahasa Indonesia. Um, and we've partnered with the Pointer Media Institute to create a Facebook for Journalists certificate. So this curriculum is super important to us because it brings together not just product knowledge and tips from Facebook, but paired with journalistic guidance from Pointer. Right now, the certificate uh, is only available in English, but anyone can take it, and it will be available in the nine additional languages within the next few months. But the free courses, which are self-directed and only take about 20 minutes each, um, are available in 10 languages. In addition to the case studies, we have a, uh, on the site, we have a safety guide that's tailored to media figures in particular, and video tutorials produced by our partners at First Draft. And our goal with the website and the curriculum and really all of our training is to give you all a one-stop shop of detailed guidelines, right? So not just on how the products work, but showing you what other journalists in your region, outside your region are trying. Uh, we also want to make sure these courses are really helpful to people at all levels in your newsroom. So if you have examples or, sorry, suggestions for courses you'd like to see us cover, uh, again, just find me at the booth upstairs um, before end of day Thursday. Um, so we know that Facebook has become a key platform for connecting people to the stories they care about. And this means that journalists have a growing opportunity to use our tools and products in every phase of the news gathering cycle. So from finding story ideas, discovering user-generated content that you want to turn into a story, um, telling that story through innovative uh, formats or even straightforward formats such as notes, um, and then engaging with your followers, right? So building out a follower base um, for your personal brand and page and content. 
Uh, Facebook and Instagram are very effective platforms for you to do that, to find that valuable newsworthy content. This is kind of a high level overview of how when we're building products, these are kind of three critical phases that we're thinking about for media figures. Um, and those are the ones we're going to walk through today. So discovering content, telling your story, and engaging with your followers. Uh, late last year, we surveyed about 200 journalists about their news gathering needs, and we've used that for uh, a basis in iterating on products like Signal and in setting up training courses. And I'm going to go deeper on Signal in just a few moments. But one area that we heard that journalists wanted to see more in uh, product features was detecting events. Uh, we heard loud and clear that this is something that journalists uh, wanted more abilities to do. You can do that now and signal through emerging trends, which will show you when something is just starting to bubble up on the platform. Identifying sources, figuring out the ways that you can reach out to those sources to verify that content, whether that's through Messenger or WhatsApp, and how you can securely do so both for you and the source. And then publishing and distributing the story, right? So making sure that your content finds the right audience, um, it finds people that are naturally interested in it, and can help you amplify and engage that to a larger audience. So we'll start off really quickly talking about discovering content and how you can use Facebook and Instagram pro products um, as news gathering platforms. Worldwide, there are over 1.86 billion monthly active Facebook users. They're generating an immense amount of content on a daily basis. Um, every day, people capture newsworthy content on their phones. They upload these images and videos to Facebook and Instagram. And it's a prime opportunity for journalists to mine that content and incorporate it into the stories and ideas that you're already working on. So for Signal, one of the things, uh, f how many people here have heard of Signal by show of hands? Awesome. So uh, caveat up front, it is most useful for English language newsrooms, but we're rapidly trying to iterate and improve that for other languages. But if you would like access, I can get you access right after this. Uh, we'd heard that journalists wanted an easy way to make Facebook a more vital part of their news gathering um, process with the ability to surface relevant trends, photos, videos, um, and in a way that's really useful for someone that's crafting a story. So Signal is a standalone dashboard tool built for that that's only available to journalists um, and to newsrooms. You can see what conversations are resonating on Facebook. So unlike kind of trending that the public sees, you can see trending and see those trends in chronological order and unranked. They come in uh, by category. If you only want, to, for example, to see the political trends or sports trends, you can really drill down by category of what you're interested in. Again, you can see the emerging trends, which uh, the caveat there is that you will need to do a little more due diligence to verify that it's something that's kind of happening in the real world. Um, Signal also has, and this is, I think, one of the most powerful search features right now for Instagram. You can search by location, by multiple hashtags, or even inside a list of accounts. And once you get the results back, you can filter by media type. So you could, for example, search only for Instagram videos, tagged protests in Jakarta, Indonesia from a list of accounts that you trust. So it can be a really useful way to find eyewitness footage uh, from stories that you're covering. Uh, we also have these competitive leaderboards, which are great for beat reporters who want to keep tabs on a set genre of people. Uh, the leaderboards track public conversations uh, across authors, journalists, uh, sports figures, politicians, and you can just see what they're saying in real time um, and see how people are interacting with that content. Um, the last thing is you can curate kind of content and data. If any of you use uh, Storyfy, we have similar. You can create a custom collection, and then you can seamlessly integrate that with your newsroom's content management system or with a broadcast package. No, it's, it, this is for public content by either pages or um, users who have chosen to post publicly. But yeah, it respects all privacy settings. Cool. Um, and then CrowdTangle. Quick show of hands if you've heard of CrowdTangle. Nice. She stands alone. Uh, so CrowdTangle is one that we're really excited about. It's a company we acquired a few months ago. Um, and it's amazing at two really distinct things. The first, it's a fantastic way to learn about how your uh, content is performing, and that's not Facebook specific. CrowdTangle will show you how your content is performing across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. Um, it can help you benchmark. You can see who else shared it. You can track comparable publishers. 
Uh, two big use cases we see are newsrooms that are using it internally to kind of motivate their reporters and their editors and to see how they're performing within the, the organization. And then regional publishers using it a lot to kind of benchmark themselves against their local competitors. It's also a really great news gathering tool. It lets you search by geography for posts that are starting to go viral. You can follow pages like first responders or local police stations or politicians um, who might surface other stories you might have otherwise missed. And you can set up kind of pretty extensive digests where you can have these emailed directly to yourself or to your entire newsroom or a set group of people that you've created a dashboard for. Uh, when we acquired CrowdTangle, we made it free, and we're hoping to kind of rapidly onboard people. So, again, if this is something that you think you or your newsroom would be interested in, um, if you come by the booth, we can uh, get you set up with kind of a training session and then get you onto that, pl that product. So groups are one of the products that I'm most excited about uh, for journalists, both from the news gathering side and the engagement side, which we'll get to in a few. But more than one billion people around the world use groups every month. They you know, provide a space for people to communicate about shared interests with specific people. Um, we found recently that more than 100 million people on Facebook are connected to what we call very meaningful groups, meaning shortly after joining these groups, it becomes kind of the most important part of their Facebook experience. Uh, groups can also be a really great way to crowdsource content in a very targeted way, to find new sources, to gather ideas and opinions on the things you're already working on, and to kind of fact check information in your gut on the angle of your story. So in this example, the New York Times created a group called Paying Till It Hurts, um, and the purpose was to create kind of informal but informed discussion around healthcare and the price that people were paying for healthcare and how they felt about that and what topics they thought that reporters were missing out and reporting on. And the reporter for the story would go on to say, as a result of this time series, my Facebook group and my forthcoming book, I have many more tips for stories than I can do. There's so many things to investigate. And you know, to be clear, this is a reporter who already had her story idea. She already had her series idea. And she pitched this group to her editors just as a way to supplement the, uh, and get feedback on stories she already had planned. But what she saw over time was that it really became a mechanism for her to get new story ideas that she hadn't thought of yet and to find new sources that she could use in future stories. So this group currently has more than 7,600 members. And the reporter, who's actually left the Times now, um, is still active in that group today. She's really formed her own community within that group around that topic. Uh, we're also seeing groups that are actually creating their own online communities to encourage civil discourse as its own form of local storytelling. Um, I love this example. This is by a news organization in Alabama, and they decided to bring together two groups of people who were pretty at odds before the U.S. election. They took a group of Donald Trump voters from Alabama and put them in a group with Hillary Clinton voters from California, and then they asked them to talk about politics. Um, this would actually go on to result in several, uh, a long-running series and several videos and digital pieces for AL.com. The one thing that they did that was like particularly key here is they really nurtured and moderated that conversation. So AL.com used an outside agency, but you could enlist trusted partners in your community or a social media editor in your newsroom. Um, but you really want to make sure that the level of discourse is kind of staying out of something that you feel comfortable with. We're also starting to test a feature called Groups for Pages, which would be really exciting if we launch it publicly. What that will do is allow you to, as a page administrator, link your page to a group so you're not necessarily starting from scratch in terms of fan base. Uh, so questions so far about news gathering or discovering content or signal? Awesome. Oh, yeah. Sure, are you, what is, what, what, sorry, which the question was whether it's only available for journalists, for non-journalists. So that's something, um, you can email me after the session and I can uh, definitely jot you down and check with our product team on when they plan to scale that out. Yeah, for now, um, we're focusing mainly on publishers and newsroom-based journalists. So we're going to jump into specific strategies um, and experiments you might try in telling your story, but I want to stress there is no secret sauce to success on Facebook. Um, what works for one publisher's audience may not work for another's, so 
it's really important whether you're running a publisher page or your individual journalist page that you're tracking your insights and seeing what's resonating with your audience. Um, that said, we did recently examine data across hundreds of local U.S. publishers and we found that their link content and video content did in fact primarily reach audiences within their home state markets. So Facebook can really be an effective tool for reaching the regional audiences that um, are part of your community and extended community. How many times per day should we post? I get this one also a lot. Again, there's no hard and fast rule here, but based on that data, we saw some very successful regional US publishers posting roughly between 25 and 40 times per day. Uh, per publisher page, yeah, yeah. So again, I wanna stress here that you should uh, make sure that you're looking really closely at your page insights. If you're finding that your audience has an appetite for more than 45 articles a day, then you shouldn't hesitate to post that, um, that much content. Um, but this is what we found for a sweet spot of, of people that were posting and, and having some success and growth. Um, when you break that post down, that post breakdown down, about a quarter of the posts were videos, um, half were links, and the rest are, were photos or other post types. Um, again, we, we recommend here is that you make sure that your posting strategy aligns with your business goals. So if referral traffic is something that's super important to you, more so than video, or you find that your audience doesn't engage with video as much as articles, um, this is an area where you should use, let insights be your guide. But we do know that links in particular, whether they open up in instant articles or uh, direct, directly to your website, really do drive meaningful engagement back to your stories in those home markets. Uh, so how long should my videos be? Um, we know that many of you are starting to use video stories um, on Facebook increasingly, and this is another question we get a lot. What we tell people is it's not so much about the ideal length, it's about however long that video is, making sure you're thinking about maximizing your viewing time per video. So not just the raw number of views, what you wanna do is be creating videos that are really compelling and engaging enough to your audience that they want to watch more and more and get further through because that's one, a completion rate kind of is one of the signals that we look at when uh, servicing content for people. Um, as far as individual journalists, so um, you're the expert in the topics that your followers care about and you should capitalize on that in a way that seems authentic and resonates with your followers but also leverages your expertise. And so we see journalists having a lot of success when they do things like bring people behind the scenes. So sharing photos and videos and scenes of your reporting really gives your audience access to the interesting people and places that you cover. I think for journalists, you can forget um, how fascinating that process is to people that only read the final or view the final product and have never been behind the scenes. Um, sharing the story behind the story and providing that context, giving readers insight into how the article even came to be in the first place or why it's important in the larger scheme of things can really deepen their connection with the content. Uh, Farah Faisal here it reports for KSTP and the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and she does a great job of localizing a global story for her followers and tying it back to Minnesota whenever she can. So on the left, she's written kind of like just a simple status post with a photo, but she's making note of being in Mogadishu where she's currently stationed and running into someone from her home state. She also posts kind of frequent video clips, sometimes humorous ones, which we'll see in a sec, where, but many of them bring her readers into her reporting process and just give them a feeling of being behind the scenes with her um, on whatever she's working on. It's another volume issue, but she's, uh, she's telling people here, how she's in this desert, ready to carry this, uh, cover this story, and then boom, they got a flat, tower, flat tire. And she goes into how it's not as glamorous as it looks, but you can tell this is something like she had planned to go live and had a hit, and she just kind of rolled with the punches, and it felt really authentic and personable to the audience that was watching it. Um, that tie between someone in Minnesota that's kind of connecting to a reporter that they know and trust that's halfway around the world is really a good way to kind of deepen your audience's connection with your content. So some general best practices to consider when developing your Facebook strategy and actually crafting the posts that you're writing. Um, we touched on this before, there's no magic number, but whatever cadence you decide, consistency really is key. Every time you post, you increase the opportunities for your followers to see that post in newsfeed. 
um, and engage with your stories in newsfeed, and therefore you send a signal to newsfeed about the relationship between you and that person. So going dark for a few weeks and then kind of resurrecting when you have a big project can be kind of counteractive or counter-effective to what your goals are there. Um, engage your artists by uh, posting a mix of content types. Reporter Scott Harbaugh is excellent at this. Uh, in the course of a week, he will share everything from a video related to his beat to a photo from his personal life um, to a status update speaking directly to his followers. So from posting frequency to post format, whether that's photos, videos, links, the more you know about your specific audience and what they're engaging with, um, the better equipped you're going to be to deliver meaningful news to them. But above all, as a journalist, you need to be timely, relevant, conversational, and really authentic to who you are. Uh, this may vary if you're publishing um, to your newsroom's page, but when you're on your personal page or profile, uh, readers really, really appreciate that kind of authentic voice of who you are as a journalist. So in terms of actually writing them when dealing with link shares or video, uh, dealing with the caption I mean here, avoiding clickbait is really key. People have told us again and again that uh, headlines with clear, accurate headlines are the ones that resonate the most. Um, when the headline of a story includes kind of misleading information, people think it's disingenuous and spammy. So instead of relying on kind of like a misleading or teaser headline, what you want to do is share an article with a straightforward headline, but use kind of that caption field to touch on uh, why the reader should be or viewer should be connected to this story. What can you say that will make that story find its best audience and make it meaningful to them? So these are two really simple examples, but I purposely choose them because on the left one, this post reads, uh, Lily King is Evansville's first Olympic individual gold medalist. So it's one simple line, but it celebrated a hometown hero during the Olympics when Newsfeed was swarmed with Olympics content. Um, and it immediately let everyone in that town know why they should care about this. It would have been even better if they tagged Lily King. When you tag uh, another public page, your content becomes eligible to be seen in the newsfeed of people who liked that page, which can potentially increase your distribution. Um, if you find yourself stuck wondering what to tag, kind of think of the kind of basic who, what, where, why, and how elements of a story and use that as your starting point. On the right, this reporter, Kira Charlin, had been following the story of an injured deputy for months and long enough for her to become really uh, savvy and aware of what hashtags the community was using to coalesce around the topic. You can see there, she's got a very simple video, but she used the ha hashtags, which, which served two purposes. It added her content to the ongoing conversation on Facebook that uh, readers were having, um, but it also gave them another entry point to connect with other people that might want to engage with this. Um, using hashtags and keywords make your content easier to find, and when you're thinking about how shareable something is, both of these posts, I think, do this well. Think about identity and emotion. Those are really big drivers of shares among friends and family. Yeah? No, but that is a great product. I, well, actually, I take that back. If you post from Instagram to Facebook, um, yeah, the hashtag will surface Facebook results. The hashtag will remain if it's in the caption. Yeah. Instagram also has emoji hashtag search, which is pretty good. Uh, so, not unlike newspapers or TV, uh, compelling imagery can really make or break a story on Facebook. Uh, we've seen journalists use photos to great effect to kind of quickly convey timely information, such as early uh, photos from the scene of breaking news. The photo format is highly shareable, so it's something that your followers and your audience can easily share out to their network to convey kind of important information. Uh, on the left, this is a really simple video. As you can see, it's just B-roll, uh, but Fred Davenport posted this, thinking about the autoplay and sound off experience. Um, this is a video that works well in that scene. He posted the video, he gave context in the status update, he continued to update that, but very quickly readers could see it in newsfeed and know what they were gonna get. Um, one thing when we say, think about the three second audition, right? I also call it the thumb stopper. So you have people that are on the app and they're scrolling because a lot of these views are happening on mobile. What kind of imagery can you use that will make them stop their thumb and look at the content? So thinking about how the content's gonna play um, with sound off and with autoplay on 
is really important in terms of crafting your video. And then on the right, this is David Guttenfelder, who's a photojournalist for uh, National Geographic. And he's actually been innovating really well in using Instagram stories. Uh, he uses a mix of photos and videos. He uses them on very kind of important breaking news or hard news events. And this clip, he is at the scene of Fidel Castro's funeral procession. And he's just kind of walking people through it. Um, and it's still a very compelling, it's obviously not just great photojournalism, but it's really compelling just because he keeps the mix. Um, he keeps a mix that keeps it going and interesting and compelling for the people that are watching it. So, uh, sorry, make, let me make sure I understand. So when they post on Facebook a link to the Instagram photo? Uh, if, I share, uh, if I upload the photo initially to Instagram, mm -hmm. then I just you know, share one on Instagram or maybe to Facebook. Sure. When people share that photo, the share counter doesn't add up. It doesn't uh, appear to the number of shares. So it's just going to be, would it be advisable to just post that picture to Instagram? Uh, that's a good question. Let me find me afterward and uh, we can dig in kind of the product details and I'll figure out what's going on there. Yeah. So these are some stats kind of. We know that uh, uh, you guys are starting to use more and more video that the rapid growth of video on Facebook has really changed the way that you're thinking about producing video. Um, this slide kind of demonstrates just how amazing the video consumption trends on Facebook um, have become. So people are consuming 100 million hours per day of video. 75% of this is happening on, on mobile. Um, these discovery experiences depend heavily on the three second audition, stopping the thumb scroll, looking for the thumb stopper, um, and then the last stat, which I find fascinating, is that it comes from sharing, right? So almost half of all video watching is happening because people are sharing this to their friends and their family. Um, this sharing by friends is a really powerful mechanism uh, for people to discover new content, to perhaps give a video a chance that they wouldn't have otherwise because it's coming from a trusted person. Um, and it contributes to this kind of social viewing experience that we think is key to all of our platform, our video products. Um, so it's no secret that we've made a huge investment in video um, across the company, and in 2016, we really saw that uh, start to pay off. So live video is nothing new, especially to uh, a room full of journalists. Um, but it does offer a really different experience than video on demand. As technology has improved, um, it's allowed each of us to go live from a moment's notice, and we're seeing more and more creative uses of live storytelling for smaller screens. Um, so I wanted to talk for a second just about um, what viewers find valuable based on some focus groups that we ran around live. None of these are surprising, but I hope they kind of form an easy checklist for you when you're thinking about the story you're covering and whether it's the right context or opportunity for you to go live. Uh, immediacy and interactivity. People love uh, the feeling that they have access, that they're right there with you as you're, you're filming this live and chasing this story. Um, a unique perspective. They love seeing glimpses of your process, going back to going behind the scenes. Um, they like seeing this side of you that they've never seen before. Um, Social connection, in addition to feeling really connected to the broadcaster, people feel really connected to the other people that are watching this live moment happen with them. You see this again and again in comments where it can really make it a more meaningful experience for people when they're experiencing it with people uh, that are watching it live halfway across the world. Um, authentic authenticity, uh, people love how live lets them see the full unedited scene. They can form their own views of things in real time. Um, and I would also add there, in terms of authenticity, it goes back to kind of the journalist and the journalist imparting their personality a bit. We've seen a lot of local news morning anchors who do these live hits um, as they're on air. They do it in commercial breaks almost. And people love that. They love feeling like they're getting a little bonus from the main viewing screen that everyone is getting on TV. 
And then excitement and surprise. Everyone loves a good car chase or an exploding watermelon. Uh, anything can happen on live, and that sense of urgency makes it a really special experience for people that are watching it. It makes it kind of a, a can't turn it off experience. All right. Questions about telling your story before we jump into uh, engagement? Yeah. Sure, yeah, so we should go deeper after this. At a high level, yes, if you're a page or publisher, you have the option to boost certain posts, um, which, you know, that depends kind of on if you have something that you might in particular want to highlight um, or get extra eyes on or target to a specific audience, but uh, it really is going to vary based on what your strategy is, yeah. Yeah, no, I just, I do, I definitely want to clarify. I'm not, I'm not telling you you should post 25 to 45 times a day. Uh, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so nothing bad is going to happen, right? It's going to, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. Um, really, listen, for a long time we kind of didn't, um, we really didn't want to be prescriptive at all, right? You know, we think you know your audience best. We try to kind of improve the tools around insights that can help you make those calls. That number is reflection of a very kind of limited set um, of data, a test that we ran, just to try to give some guidelines and help publishers understand what other publishers were doing. Um, so we found that some local U.S. publishers that were doing well were in the sweet spot of 25 to 45. We've seen publishers that publish 80 times per day. Uh, we've seen publishers that do far less than that in pages and profiles. Um, again, it depends what your audience has an appetite for, but uh, if you have good content, um, you shouldn't hesitate in posting it. Um, the flip side of that would be uh, don't think you need to push out a link just to hit a quota of a certain amount of content. Sure. Yeah, I went so first draft, we're actually part of the first draft coalition. Um, so we've partnered with them on, on a number of things, including the PSAs. Uh, I'm not familiar, I wasn't in the session, I was in here prepping, but yeah, if you want to find me after it, I can kind of dig down into that. Do I feel that people trust Facebook? Um, yeah, so, so if you want to talk, so if you're asking about false news, right, um, this is something we've been working on a long time that we're going to continue to do. Um, false news is not something that we want on our platform, and we really feel that all of us, tech companies like ourselves and Google, media organizations, newsrooms, teachers, we all have this responsibility to kind of address it. Um, and we've been trying to do that in a few ways, which are the newsfeed PSAs, uh, the third-party fact-checking coalitions, and the News Integrity Initiative. And so we really want to make sure that we're giving both publishers the tools that can help them dispute that and use their expertise to help kind of guide readers there, but also we want to make sure that we are educating people and having like an informed community on Facebook. So one thing we did look at when you looked at false news was a lot of that was kind of economically incentivized. Um, our developers are working really hard. If you know, you've seen these, right? You click on a link, you go to a site that's almost completely ads, and um, that's an economic model that we think our developers will be able to disrupt. Could I go further on that? Sure. I'm Wally, Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh,
hatred and incite violence. My question is uh, one for public use and the second is connected to journalism. Um, how would you detect hate speech? And if you so detect hate speech, uh, what cases of uh, hate speech intrusion have you been able to, uh, to detect? And how would you remove such hate speech? Sure. As well as fake news. And my second question is going back to the terms of service. Uh, what parts of the terms of Sure. So our terms of our community standards are really clear about violence and uh, harassment and hate speech and, and, and all those things. And so uh, my colleague Claire Waring is here from the policy team and she can get into the nitty gritty with you of what people are doing. But um, we have a really robust operations team that uh, when users, Facebook is a very user driven platform, when users flag that content, uh, this operations team looks at millions of pieces of content um, per week, um, and it's something we take really seriously in terms of getting that stuff off. And question to journal uh, in reference to journalists, um, I'm going to touch on it toward the end, but we do have certain kinds of like comment moderation features and tools that allow you not just to ban um, a page, right, because those people often pop up under a different account and, and try to troll you from there, but to uh, kind of ban on your page, we allow you to set whatever policy you feel comfortable with on your page. Um, and you can ban specific phrases, phrases so that journalists are not being harassed um, or trolled or kind of maligned on their pages in those ways. But uh, Claire can give you kind of like some really deep details in terms of how the operations team is trying to, trying to scale what's, what's a very serious issue. So detection first comes from people reporting to you that there's some uh, uh, speech Two ways, right? So um, we are obviously, we are a tech company and we're trying to scale. So artificial intelligence is one way that we're hoping that we can kind of programmatically start to recognize this content. Um, before it's even on the platform. Um, and then we take very seriously things that uh, users report. So one report by user is enough to get something kicked up to our operations team for review to find out if it violates our community standards. <laughs> so it means that oh, you you vote for him. When I uh, take a photo with something like this, it's so it's uh, about politics, like sure. like this. So it means that you vote for number one. Okay. okay. <laughs> you vote for Trump or for it's, it's very complicated. Yeah. It's kind of, but it's different story. But it means that we much more careful about it. Yeah. I cannot share how I feel about the riots or but the campaign or something else. I have the feeling. I mean, I have opinion. I have my own opinion. But sure. I Sure. So that's a yeah, no, I empathize there. I worked, listen, I can tell you the New York Times was ridiculously strict about what we could and could not post yes. on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, you would very quickly get called into an office if you posted anything that even remotely hinted at having an opinion. So I posted a lot of food articles during those years. Um, so, you know, obviously you're going to have to align kind of your f Facebook strategy with your newsroom ethical guidelines and what your, your publisher feels comfortable with. Um, 
I think, though, there are ways that you could definitely bring in and, and kind of like if you're a political reporter that's covering something, um, still share something behind the scenes that doesn't kind of cross the line into kind of offering an opinion or bias or showing some bias. But yeah, I feel your pain there. My Facebook is much more exciting now. <laughs> Feedback, yeah. So I need to edit it, but I cannot edit it because I'm not good in application and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, well. I cannot open my laptop every, every time I need because on travel. Or yeah. I would say use live more. You know, like one of the really amazing things about live is it was built as a consumer product that we quickly saw journalists um, adopt. But one of the things that's amazing about live is that it's raw. It's not, uh, v viewers don't expect it to be this really highly produced kind of stand up traditional thing. They like that it's kind of raw and it's just a reporter out there. And so um, you can maybe trim it a little. <laughs> afterwards, but uh, don't feel that every time you go live or every time you broadcast to your followers that it needs to be kind of like a television station worthy um, production. We have like a lot of examples where, you know, the product was designed to be used like this that and that we had to add features later because we realized that it was a really great tool for journalists. So, yeah, I think um, don't be, yeah, don't, don't gate yourself out there. It's definitely something you can do. So um, talking for a second about um, a journalist and you, you know, you connect people with stories you're covering each day and in turn they want to hear, they want to connect with you. They want to engage more deeply, not just around the topic, but hearing your personal voice um, on the topic. So uh, Dan Rather is a fantastic example, not just because he's such a renowned journalist, but he really embraced Facebook last year which is more than a decade after he left CBS Evening News. He's likened his Facebook page to a virtual town hall. That's how it feels to him. He posts a variety of content from long status updates that go deep into his analysis um, or opinion on a topic or even just a short link share that gives people uh, some context around something that he didn't cover. Uh, in the past year alone, he's gone from 74,000 followers to more than 2 million. Um, and uh, some of his posts, long, long status posts, so if you don't believe that people will consume long content, check out Dan Rather's page. Some of those posts have gotten more than 20 million views, and all of those, most of those posts have a really active, robust comment section. And what Rather said recently is, among the things we like about Facebook is that it's a conversation. People talk to you, and it's not always complimentary. What's been built here is a community of people who indicated that they have some trust that I will try to talk at least sanely about what's going on. Uh, he has a second page now that called News and Guts where he also shares kind of um, um, present or posts and articles and is continuing to build his presence. But the one key thread, I think, and this is why he's seen such great success through both those pages, is he has a style, he has a tone, He's obviously very authoritative as a journalist and in this space, but he talks to people in a really personable way. Um, they don't feel like they're being broadcast to. They feel like they're having a conversation with an expert they know and trust. Uh, so circling back to groups, as I said, uh, groups are also a really exciting product for engagement side. We saw Vox use this to really great effect when they created a group for Obamacare enrollees who wanted to know what would happen if the American Health Care Act was repealed. Um, more than 1,000 people originally joined the group, and Sarah Cliff, who was a reporter on that, sought feedback from people about their stories and what topics they wanted to learn more about. And Cliff would say, we learned that a Facebook community can be an incredibly productive space for our readers to go through a shared experience together. And for us at Vox to interact with our audience in a completely new way. Um, what's really awesome about this is after the, uh, the group had been active for maybe six months, uh, Cliff would actually go on to interview President Obama on uh, Facebook Live with an audience that was partly selected from people that had been active in the group. 
So even without a large project that's uh, specifically driven by groups, I often tell journalists to think about finding a topical group where you can seed your content. Um, there is a group for almost everything you can think of on Facebook. So if you cover a niche science bee, it's worth trying to find a group um, that's dedicated to that, introducing yourself, sharing your content. These are people that have already shown you that they're interested in the topic and maybe uh, more, nat uh, more likely to organically amplify that through their network. So uh, replying to engaging with your commenters. Um, in terms of connecting with your audience, it's really, really key that you avoid just posting something and then walking away from it. We've seen a lot of journalists have success when they make themselves accessible to their followers um, by responding to comments, even just by liking the posts or engaging with their audience in some form. Um, I'm not suggesting that you become a 24-hour, 7 comment replying machine, <laughs> but uh, it's really an opportunity to build trust and loyalty. Um, it can ultimately maybe surface new leads for stories, but even if it doesn't, it becomes this kind of two-way conversation uh, and a feedback loop, which makes your viewers or your readers uh, think that you're paying attention and they have a reason to return to your page. Um, so to my point about not needing to do this 24-7, uh, this reporter, Eric Hansen, does this on a lot of posts. Sometimes it's to clarify a question that readers have about something he covered on air, but sometimes it's just a simple, like, thanks for reading, uh, thanks for following. He doesn't do it on every post, but um, he's seen a lot of strong go growth over the past year uh, because people feel like they're connecting with him directly. Um, another great example I love is this one by Deborah Acosta at the New York Times. Um, she actually invited readers into the reporting process. She was walking down the street in New York City one day and she found these photo slides on the ground and she invited readers to help her figure out what was going on. Uh, yeah, we really need this. That's unfortunate. Deb Acosta, yeah, uh, Deborah Acosta at the New York Times. So what she's saying, I've watched this enough times I can almost uh, subtitle for you. Um, she's saying that she invited people on Facebook. She's walking, she finds these Kodachrome. There you go. The next comment, which I added this too soon, is uh, why are you digging through someone's trash, weirdo? Um, but uh, what I really love about this video, um, a few things. For one, it was a totally reporter-driven story, right? She's on her way home. She sees something that's interesting. Uh, she quickly pitched her editor on it uh, by framing it as something that they could bring people into the process. Um, and after that, you can see on the right, um, she really engaged with people who had follow-up questions from there. Um, you can see the publisher page where the New York Times is engaging and replying, but Deb um, was really steadfast about coming back to this over the next few weeks so that the people that had helped her discover this story could feel like they had access to her. Um, yeah. This, this story? You don't find in this story journalism. Yeah. Uh, so this would be a lo this is a local metro story. It was a it was a pretty popular video for the New York Times. It was kind of something that they considered a mystery. Uh, I won't tell you the ending, but if you go to Pointer, they did a write up on this story because they found it uh, such an interactive experience. I would call this journalism, yes. Yeah. For the Times, for. I think there's a lot of value in user-generated content and users kind of interacting with reporters, to be sure. Uh, it's, yes, it's hard, very difficult to publish a video in print. <laughs> 
Um, uh, you can go to Dean, I mean, I, if you're doubting whether this was a valuable video, I would encourage you to go to Dean Bacay, the executive editor's page, where he very highly touted it, which Dean does not do casually. Um, they're really proud of this video over there, and they're really proud of uh, a lot of the ways that they worked with their audience to develop the story. Yeah. How did they? Yeah. Oh, they started like uh, there was a whole like writing of like what the Code of Crime uh, slides could have came from, who they would have belonged to, who they'd seen in the past that had done it. Um, there's a really really great point or article that details uh, uh, how they did it, okay. and the ending, which I won't tell. Yeah. Yeah, they did more than one live video. This is just the, the, what I've shown you here is the clip of the last one, but they did more, yeah, they did more than one live video on this. Hi. Sure. So Facebook is a platform for ideas. It's a place for people to connect to the things they care about. We um, are not at all seeking to be the arbiter of what is and isn't journalism. And if that wasn't clear, that was my personal opinion, that I find that, mo that Metro story to be very compelling as journalist, um, uh, agnostic of any platform, right? So um, our goal is not to define journalism. My goal is to help journalists who want to use Facebook um, kind of figure out the best tips and strategies to do so. Yeah, for sure. I, so I would agree with your boss going back to the earlier slide. If, it's, if your primary business goal is referral traffic, then you should focus more heavily on links and link shares because that's going to drive people back to your website. Um, if Facebook Live is something that you want to try but you also want to use uh, referral traffic, one tactic you might try is coming back when the live is done, editing the caption, and adding a link to a related story so that people at least have the option to click off to it. But yeah, our, our goal is to make sure that the, you're using the products that most mesh with what your business goals are long term. Cool. So a couple more quick hits um, in terms of how you can build your presence here. Um, I was actually, auth author tags I usually say is one of my favorite products that's underused, but I saw that UNESCO uses them, Medi, on their page. So author, ta author tags are this thing here. Um, it's a really simple implementation. You add one line of code to your website and you can connect the bylines from people in your newsroom to their Facebook profiles uh, or pages. And the way it works there is uh, a reader will click on an article in newsfeed, and when she returns the newsfeed, she would see a prompt such as see more from this reporter, and it's hyperlinked to their page. Um, so that can be a good way to connect with people directly in newsfeed. Um, it subs subscribes those followers to new updates. Uh, mentions for verified public figures, uh, and this kind of gets at your question about privacy. Um, mentions is a great standalone app if you're a verified uh, media public figure. 
Um, it was created to let public figures kind of talk easily to their fans and to each other. But one additional benefit we've seen is that if you're a journalist who's a little nervous that you might be posting to the wrong privacy settings, you can use the Mentions app, and anytime you post from Mentions, you know that you're going a lot like, publicly you're posting publicly to everyone on the platform, and then you can continue to use your own app, the Facebook app that is just your friends and family. Um, so it reduces a lot of the friction around um, if you're worried about switching your privacy settings. Um, the last question we get a lot, a lot, is page versus profile. Um, does everyone know the difference here between page and profile? Yeah, cool. No? Yeah, no worries. Um, a page is public. It's for organizations, for brands. Everything that's posted um, to that page is publicly available to people on Facebook. Um, this is a quick chart that gives the overview. A profile is your normal thing that we all use to join Facebook. However, you can turn follow on on your profile. So, for example, Mark Zuckerberg is on a profile, but he has follow turned on, so people that are not his friends can still see his public updates. Um, so we get the question a lot about which is better. Again, it depends on what your strategy is. If you are primarily a news gatherer, someone that reaches out to sources, you would probably want to be on a profile because you can't message from a page. You can't initiate a conversation. You can only reply to people that have messaged the page. However, if kind of deep insights and metrics are really important um, to you, uh, then you should be on a page, although we're rapidly trying to bring more of those metrics uh, over to profiles. Um, and again, I'm happy to share this chart if you want, if you manage people in your newsroom who kind of frequently ask this question about which of these they should be using. Question. Yeah. Is there an advantage for the group chat versus No. Nope. Yeah, no. I think there's a, a lot of uh, uh, discrepancy in people thinking there is. Uh, the blue check mark is really only for accounts that are um, facing someone trying to impersonate them. So uh, the verification team has a pretty rigorous uh, process to evaluate that. But if you are concerned that someone is trying to impersonate your page, um, you can find me afterward, and I can figure out uh, how to file that for you. But um, in terms of actual performance on the platform, there's no difference. Um, so quickly, uh, facebook.com slash journalist has a much more detailed safety guide, but I did want to hit on it at a high level in terms of some of the basic things that we encourage all journalists to do. Um, the first one is pretty obvious, that the password should be different across all the applications and devices um, and compared to other sites that you're using, so you can kind of avoid collateral damage if your passport for, or password for one site is discovered. Um, avoid public information like your name, uh, use a combination of numbers and lever letters. Uh, definitely show, turn on login alerts. This will send you a text message or email when um, someone logs in from a device that Facebook doesn't recognize and it'll cut off that login until you actually uh, manually approve it. Uh, Two-factor authentication is very similar to that. You'll get a text message or a code where someone can't access your account with just the password. Uh, and then if you think you're hacked, facebook.com slash hacked has a really step, simple flow of a few steps to walk you through how to secure your account, um, how to get that escalated up to our operations team so they can help you recover the account and, uh, and secure it going forward. Um, privacy checkup is great. If you are a little confused about who you're posting to from time to time, privacy checkup will walk you through a series of steps to show you these are the posts that friends can see, these are the posts that anyone on Facebook can see, these are the posts that coworkers can see, and so on. Um, and then lastly, again, touching on the comment moderation, because I think not, all, not, not enough people are aware of it, that you can ban specific praise, pay, uh, language on your profile, down to phrases even. Um, we really, really want to empower you to set your own policy, your own level of discourse. Um, obviously, things that are against community standards are taken down um, across the board. But if you just have people that you feel are derailing your conversations um, or kind of not participating to civil discourse, you can definitely set those levers on your own, um, on your own page. Questions about safety? No. Cool. So to recap, um, uh, experimenting with format types, uh, telling your story through the medium that works best for the content and your followers. So paying attention to both the topics that they interact with the most and the formats that they interact with the most. So if video is huge with your audience, um, you should continue to invest there. If link shares are better for your business model or something that your audience prefers, you should invest there. 
Um, make sure that you have groups in your wheelhouse as a product for um, connecting with a topical community or a location-based community. We see a lot of like geographical groups that do really well and have big membership. Um, they should be used as a tool both in your engagement and your news gathering strategies. Um, be authoritative but personable. Most importantly, be accessible as much as you can, um, giving yourself downtime to rest. But uh, engaging with your followers really can help you build a loyal community on your page of people who keep coming back. Um, safety measures. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the safety, uh, the full safety measures, go to facebook.com slash journalists. Um, that's been translated into a few different languages, um, and it's in PDF form. It's really easy to distribute, and it digs deeper into things like Tor um, and how you can contact uh, sources safely. Um, I think we have maybe five minutes left for questions. Hi. So um, I'd recommend a two-pronged approach. One is, again, banning the actual language of people that are coming to your page to disrupt or harass you. The other thing I would say is make sure that you're reporting it through the drop-down. Um, it's also good to give that kind of um, feedback to me now here, and we can carry that in. But having the drop-down is what helps our operations team ban those people outright over time um, and kind of help make sure they don't pop up under different accounts. Cool. Uh, so I am here at the uh, Facebook Live booth all week. If you come up with, uh, I'll be here till the end of day Thursday. If you have any additional questions, um, if you have more kind of one-to-one -one strategy questions about what might work best for your page or your organization, uh, please come find me. And thanks, you guys, for coming today.